Thank you very much. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking to you about the use of electrosurgical energy in infants and children. And I have no disclosures. So you can't give the pediatric lecture in a section without reminding people that children are not small adults. And although this little person on the slide may look like a smaller and much younger version of me, um, she has unique anatomic and physiologic characteristics that um, give you different things that you need to think about when you're using electrosurgical energy. And although some people may be thinking, hey, I don't do surgery in infants and children, and now is a great time to take a break. I would challenge you that you do, while you may not operate on young people, you do operate on people that have anatomic variations, such as people who have multiple amputations or implants, and you operate on people who have physiologic variations, such as people who are severely septic or have renal failure and are significantly edematous, and they have some of the same anatomic and physiologic challenges that you have to think about when you're using energy in children. So I would use this section, even if you don't operate on children, to test the knowledge that you have about using energy with anatomic and physiologic variations. So let's talk about some of these. So compared with adults, infants and children have a greater body surface area to volume ratio but less total body surface area. So that means less real estate to put your operative site, your monitoring devices, and things like your dispersive electrode. Less surface area to volume ratio also means that you have areas of high resistance in close proximity to area of low resistance, so your, the path of your current and the behavior of that current may be much less predictable than it is in adults. Now we've learned that tissues that have a high water content are really great conductors of current. So infants, especially newborn, preterm, and small for gestational age infants have significantly greater body water content um, than adults. And so they are great conductors of current. And finally, in pediatric surgery, we are operating on smaller anatomic structures. We use instruments that are a lot smaller, and both of these things can concentrate current in critical areas. And because the anatomic structures are so small, any injury or aberrant current can create a catastrophe. Now we've talked a little bit about fires in this section, and the small diameter pediatric airways are a setup for a fire. So you're taking combustible materials and a high concentration of oxygen and putting them together in a small space. So if you or one of your colleagues are doing oropharyngeal procedures um, or procedures that are near the airway of an infant or a child, you need to think about ways to take special precautions against having a fire. In older children, ideally, you'll have a cuffed endotracheal tube to separate the upper and lower airways. Um, usually, in children who are younger than eight, you want to use an uncuffed endotracheal tube, but you want to make sure you have an appropriate size tube so you don't have a large leak of that high concentration of oxygen around your operative field. And if you are operating on a patient that has significant cardiac or pulmonary comorbid conditions for which you have to use a high concentration of oxygen, um, you might want to consider avoiding electrosurgical devices, especially that high voltage coagulation waveform that is prone to sparking. Now, when the FUSE program started, I volunteered to be the pediatric surgery representative because I wanted to find out what settings I was supposed to be using on infants and children. And I'd never seen that written down on a per kilo basis. We do everything else on a cc's per kilo and milligrams per kilo, but what is it for energy? And Years later, I still don't have the answer to that question. As it turns out, the maximal recommended settings for your electrosurgical generator when you're operating on an infant or a child is going to vary by manufacturer and by device. Um, in general, in pediatric surgery, we use lower settings um, than most adult surgeons do, and devices may have to be specifically calibrated to be used in pediatric hospitals. Um, what I will tell you is although I do operate on 500 gram premature infants, I also operate on 300 pound teenagers. 
And I rarely use a setting, um, a cut or a coag setting above 12. Occasionally, I'll go to 15, and very rarely I'll go higher. So I would challenge all of you to find how low you can go, because you really should only be using the highest setting that you need to use to get that desired thermal effect. Now, dispersive electrodes, we've talked a lot about those. They are available in weight-based sizes for infants and children. In general, the lower limit of weight is going to be um, 400 grams or about a pound. And adult-sized dispersive electrodes can be used when a patient's weight is greater than 30 pounds or about 13 and a half kilograms. Now, the small size of children and the proximity of structures make placing those electrodes challenging. And one of the things you also have to think about in very young little babies, as well as little old ladies, is that um, delicate skin. You always have to be careful about the adhesive um, of those electrodes. When you put them on and then take them off, you can peel the skin right off, especially in a newborn or a premature infant where the skin is not well developed and really thin. Now, I've had a situation where I was operating on a premature infant, that an extremely premature infant that had free air, and um, they were like five or 600 grams, and I could not get a dispersive electrode on and have it work. So they needed a laparotomy, and I had to use a bipolar device. So when you can't get that dispersive on electrode on and working, your bipolar devices are also always your alternatives. Now, the rules for putting on dispersive electrodes in children are the same as they are for adults, so you are always looking for a site that is well vascularized and it is close to the operative site and it is convex, and you want to avoid places over bony prominences or scar tissue or implants. In neonates, in general, you're going to put that dispersive electrode on the back between the scapula and the sacrum. Um, on an infant, you can go on the back or the torso, or in a larger infant, you can put that on the thigh. Just like an adult, you do not want to cut or modify that dispersive electrode, and you don't want to overlap the edges with itself or any of the other cables or monitoring devices um, on the child. And in infants, one of the big challenges is that almost any site that you're um, putting the dispersive electrode, you are at risk for having fluid spill over from the operative site or from irrigation. Um, one of the things that I like to do is always protect my operative site with um, water-resistant drapes, as shown on this slide. Call it the dispersive electrode protector. People in the hour think I'm crazy. Um, now, going on to our smallest of patients, the unborn baby or the fetus, there's no evidence that electrosurgical energy in, used in a pregnant mother poses any risk to a fetus at any stage of development, so it can be used safely. The amniotic fluid that the fetus sits in is electrolyte rich and it protects the fetus from any concentration of current. And as you learned very early in this session, the output frequency of electrosurgical energy generators is well above that level that stimulates muscle contraction for the adult mom or for the fetus. So the only real risk to the fetus in the use of electrosurgical energy is that direct contract um, contact with the fetus either during a C-section or possibly during a fetal surgery. So that's all I have. I'll take any questions. <laughs>